Now, as a travel teacher, one of the big issues these days is the unification of Europe. Think of what's happened in the last decade or so. As Europe is united, 300 million people have the same coins in their pocket, the euro. Now, what's with this European Union? Well, Europe is creating a free trade zone to compete with the United States. You got a free trade zone in Europe of 400 million people with an economy of 13 trillion dollars. To put that into relative terms, here in the United States, we're 300 million people with an economy of 13 trillion dollars. We got the same size economy, they got more people. You'll hear Americans who are proponents of our system put down the European system because they don't make as much money as we do. Look at it. They got more people and they make the same amount of money. They, work, they make less uh, money per person than we do. Well, that's true, they make less money per person, but there's no question they make the same or more per hour than we do. They just choose to work less hours. Europeans have a different work ethic. It's not good for business. If you have a system that's business friendly, it's bad news, but over there, it's for people. I've got a friend here in the United States who's running a very small movement called Take Back Your Time. And it's sort of trying to tell Americans, we got the shortest vacation in the rich world and it's getting worse. And he reminds us that by his estimate, if you were a European working as hard as we work, October 24th would be your last day to go to work. That's why that's his national holiday, October 24th. <laughs> it's just kind of thought provoking. But don't tell anybody, let anybody tell you their system is a basket case economically. They, by their estimate, I'm not saying what's right and wrong, I'm just saying they like to work less and live more. And they make, you know, 25% less than we do and they work 25% less than we do. Now, Europe is uniting and that's the whole idea. They want a free trade zone because they got to compete with us and they've created that free trade zone with the European Union. I want to remind you, Europe is no, you know, fantasy land. I'm, I'm aware, aware of that. They've got all sorts of serious problems. A lot of people, because I go to Europe and I come home and I kind of encourage Americans to get their act together, I'm not saying we're bad and they're good. I'm just learning from them and encouraging us to learn from that and, and do a little better if we can. I don't think Europe's perfect by any means, and Europe has a lot of economic problems. I'll tell you one thing, I'd hate to run my business in Europe. I'd much rather run it here. I could never have the fun with my business in Europe that I have here, because we've got this wonderful freewheeling economic system that's sort of part of our uh, strength economically. Europe has a very difficult situation right now with its geriatric future. There's fewer young people and more old people than ever in Europe, and the prognosis is horrible for Europe. And you'll see a lot of demonstrations on the street these days because in Europe, you can't let work all your life hoping to have the same luxurious cradle-to-grave welfare security that your dad had and you've been promised in your work and all of a sudden they tell you, no, you can't have it. It's very difficult to take away these entitlements in the United States and in Europe. The fact is, in the old days, lots of young people, a few old people, they could support that, right? Now, a few young people, lots of old people, it just is economically, the equation's not there. And it's going to take very, very difficult work for politicians to tell people you can't have the, the goodies and the local people are going to be striking and out of the streets you're going to see a lot of demonstrations as Europe grapples with this new reality. Europe also has lots of problems with racism and with immigration. You know, the whole immigration problem in Europe is like any nation that brings in poor people to do the work they don't want to do. If you're rich enough to have some person from Mexico clean your house, you're going to do it. If you don't want to spend enough money for the apples to have rich kids of yours pick the apples, you'll hire people that'll work cheaper. That's just the honest truth. That's what gas starbiters are all about. We've got them. There's 100,000 Polish people working in Ireland now, gas starbiters, because Ireland is rich and Poland wants work. Germany's filled with Turks. France is filled with Algerians. It's all gas starbiters. Rich, generally white people don't want to do the dirty work, they hire poor people to do it for them. It comes with a bigger cost than your cheap labor. Because now you've got an immigrant community you need to uh, assimilate into your society. And the problem I see in Europe is that immigrant communities don't want to assimilate. It's a diaspora. They want to squat in that more comfortable country and keep their culture from home because of the modern communication opportunities and so on, they could do it. You've got third generation Algerian families in the Netherlands that don't speak a word of Dutch and don't expect their children to either. That's a problem, and that's what Europe is dealing with. It's an awkward thing to talk about, but boy, it's gonna be a tough one for Europe. The, I'm sorry? Gas Diaspora. Gas Oh, I'm sorry, thank you, guest arbeiter. That's the German, that's the German word for guest worker. Yeah, so it's almost a generic term because the Germans were the famous first ones when they were rich back in the 70s. They imported a lot of uh, Turkish labor and the Turks were all called 
Gastarbeiters. I got friends who were there that said, Ich bin ein Gastarbeiter, ich arbeiten in Deutschland für zwei Jahre. You know, that's, I could function in, German, in Turkey because so many Turks didn't speak English in the old days, they spoke German because they all went to Germany to make some serious money and then went back home. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, on one day, 10 nations joined the European Union and suddenly the geographic center of Europe shifted from Belgium to about Czech Republic. And all of a sudden you got 100 million new people or something in the Euro European Union. And boy, I tell you, it's exciting to see what's going on in Eastern Europe today. Uh, they are so excited about their freedom and their new opportunity to work hard and make money. They're having less kids and more cars. They're just embracing the whole American kind of work ethic with gusto. And it's fun to see it. When you remember the old days, when I first went to Poland, it was so bleak, so gray, so demoralizing because they had this clueless command economy from the Soviet Union where they didn't have supply and demand uh, entering into the equation. Somebody just had to say how many of this to get and how many of that to get. Well, it was just a fiasco. I remember when I first went to Poland, people were taking in their windshield wipers with them at night because they forgot to order windshield wipers and the thieves knew it. You'd rip off somebody's windshield wiper, sell it for a fortune in the black market because nobody could get windshield wipers. Well, now they're leaving their windshield wipers on the cars, you see. They've got a supply and demand economy and things are really jamming. It's great, people are working hard. It's a festival of pent-up entrepreneurial spirit when you go through Eastern Europe these days.